The Dreamcast was only with the world in a commercial sense at least for just 856 days, but it has left behind arguably some of the most iconic games in video game history, etching their way into the hearts and minds of Sega fans across the world. Dreamcast was the console which seen Sega's decades long mission finally come to pass. The arcade was now truly in the home. But the Dreamcast wasn't just arcade ports, it was home to some of the most innovative and creative work by not just Sega, but third party developers across the world, who chose Dreamcast as a canvas on which to paint their vision for gaming's future. I'm James, the Sega-holic, one half of the Sega guys, and in this video I'm going to look at some of the most iconic gaming moments on the Sega Dreamcast. By today's standards, Shenmue may come across as something of a relic. While it has a large and extremely committed fanbase today, gamers who put themselves in Ryo Hazuki's shoes for the first time in 2024 may find the controls, pace of the game, the camera and even the voice acting to have aged badly. However, back in 1999, Shenmue truly had to be seen to be believed. When playing Shenmue today, it's important to remember the gaming scene it entered, and those of us who imported Dreamcast back in the day had a glimpse of what would become Shenmue via the Project Berkeley demo disc that was packaged with Virtua Fighter 3 TB. Shenmue launched in Japan late in December 1999, but it would be a visit the next month to my local import game store, CA Games in Glasgow, that would give me a first look at Shenmue with my own eyes. You'll hear me refer to this store as Charlie's in the rest of the video, given that the CA in CA Games stood for Charlie Ambrose, owner of the store. I can still remember Charlie gleefully opening delivery and rushing to his display Dreamcast to load up what had arrived, Shenmue. Standing there with my best friend Sam, we looked up at that 16 inch CRT in the corner of the store and I can still remember seeing Ryo run up those snowy steps for the first time, glancing at the suspicious black car parked outside the entrance to his family home. The opening scene of Shenmue quite rightly kicks off this list, because the level of detail and cinematic presentation was beyond anything that we'd seen in gaming to that point. As Landy stalks Iwao Hazuki, his eyes scan the surroundings as he walks across the dojo floor, his robe and clothing creases as he moves. The characteristics of Landy are eerily human, such as the subtle head flick he gives his henchmen to look for the mirror after a while gives up its location in order to save his son's life. When both men engage in combat, the fluidity of movement was jaw-dropping, with Landy effortlessly dodging Iwao's attacks. Now, at the time, of course, we couldn't understand a word of what was going on due to the spoken Japanese dialogue, but the expressions of the characters and their tone of voice did more than enough to set the scene. Iwao's serious concern for his family, Landy's calm but menacing presence, the lurking henchman, and Ryu's anger and ultimately his pain as his father passes away in his arms following Landy's final vicious attack. The final part of this scene is made all the more powerful by its incredible orchestral score, as a battered and weakened Ryu crawls across the dojo floor to be with his dying father, each extension of Ryu's weary limbs met by a crescendo of music, only further accentuating his struggle. When Ryu cries out in pain at his father's passing, as the rain pours down and the thunder cracks overhead, I can still to this day vividly remember Charlie shouting from behind his cash desk, Lord Sega has spoken! It changed everything in terms of what we thought Dreamcast was capable of, and is arguably the most prominent Dreamcast memory I have, out with importing my own console. It may not seem like a big deal now, but seeing a brand new Resident Evil game come exclusively to a Sega console made people sit up and take notice back in 1999. A three-way production by Capcom Production Studio 4, Next Tech and Sega 
Code Veronica was specifically designed for the Dreamcast hardware. During development, Code Veronica was designated the title of Biohazard 3, a title which would eventually go to Resident Evil 3 Nemesis on the PlayStation. Now, debate has raged for years about which game is the true Resident Evil 3, with claims that Sony pushed for numbered releases in the series to be reserved only for Sony's consoles. Regardless, Code Veronica is a fantastic entry in the series, and was Capcom's best-selling game on Dreamcast, with 1.14 million copies sold. In fact, Code Veronica was the second Capcom game to surpass 1 million units on Sega hardware, Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition being the first, with 1.65 million sales on the Mega Drive. In a first for the series, Code Veronica uses 3D backgrounds instead of the usual pre-rendered 2D backgrounds. The core gameplay mechanic remains the same as previous games, with tank controls and a heavy use of your inventory to equip weapons, heal yourself and solve puzzles. Following the destruction of Raccoon City, Claire Redfield heads for Umbrella's HQ in Europe looking for her missing brother Chris. Claire is captured, however, and sent to a prison on Rockford Island, which also doubles as an Umbrella training facility. Following her escape, Claire teams up with fellow prisoner Steve Burnside and seeks to stop the sadistic Ashford twins and their plans to unleash their Project Veronica experiment, unaware that her brother Chris Redfield is en route to the island to rescue his sister. When Sega exited the hardware game, Code Veronica lost its exclusivity, coming to PlayStation 2 and GameCube the following year in the form of Code Veronica X. Dreamcast also received this enhanced version of the game, but only in Japan, going by the name Code Veronica Kanzenban. There's no doubt that Code Veronica sold many a Dreamcast console, given the popularity of the Resident Evil series, and seeing a brand new flagship Resident Evil game not only debut on, but be exclusive to Sega hardware? That truly was an iconic moment. Soul Calibur coming to Dreamcast was a big deal back in the day. Namco had become synonymous with PlayStation during the previous generation, with hits like Tekken, Ridge Racer, Time Crisis and more. Soul Calibur, the sequel to 1996's Soul Edge, was highly anticipated, with many expecting it to come to Sony's PlayStation, including Edge magazine, who in their arcade coverage stated that Tekken 3 proved that PlayStation could handle a port of Soul Calibur. In an ironic twist, this very arcade feature was in issue 67 of Edge, the very issue which covered the unveiling of the Dreamcast at the 1998 New Challenge Conference, making it almost eerily prophetic. And in a move which raised many an eyebrow, Namco chose the Dreamcast as the platform which would host Soul Calibur, and what they delivered was more than a mere port. Namco enhanced the game in every way to take advantage of Sega's new hardware. Soul Calibur's intro not only set the scene wonderfully, but featured character models taken entirely from the in-game engine, meaning this was the first Namco game that didn't open with a CGI sequence like, say, Tekken or Soul Edge. The level of detail was breathtaking at the time, and has held up exceptionally well. Facial expressions, detailed weapons and clothing, and incredible movement on show as each fighter showcases their fighting style. It wasn't until you got into the game itself, though, for the first time, that you realised what you'd just seen was actually the very characters you'd control in the game. I can still remember getting my Japanese copy from a place called Partic Game Station. Now, to this day, I have no idea where the owner of this store got that one solitary copy from. He didn't sell any other imports, but he just wanted £35 for it. I rushed home, picked up some old big box Amiga games that I still owned, and traded them in towards that copy of Soul Calibur. My best friend Sam and I went back to mine, and our minds were blown, and I can still remember both of us going up close to the TV screen when we unlocked Lizard Man, proclaiming that, you can see the individual scales. It's little wonder that Soul Calibur has aged so well. It was so far ahead of anything we'd ever seen in the home at that point. 
if there's one thing the Dreamcast is renowned for, it's the incredible originality within its library. Smilebit's Jet Set Radio, released in 2000, is considered by many as one of the pioneers of cell shaded graphics, which gives the game a unique and striking look. Taking on the role of Beat, founder of the GG's gang, you skate your way around areas of Tokyo to tagging rival gangs turf. Jet Set Radio's gameplay is backed by an utterly brilliant soundtrack, composed by the legendary Hideki Naganuma. The sound is provided in the story by the legendary Professor K, host of pirate radio station Jet Set Radio. To tag rivals turf you need to collect paint cans scattered around the level. The larger the tag, the more paint you'll need and the more complex the controller inputs will be to complete them. Now, the controls are something that I don't think get enough credit in Jet Set Radio, because they cleverly replicate the sensation of spraying a can of paint. Tagging involves rotating the analogue stick in accordance with the on-screen arrows, which replicates your character's wrist movements of the spray can, while holding the left trigger signifies holding down the button on the top of the can. In fact, you can't begin tagging until you hold down the left trigger, or hold down the button on the spray can. It's so clever and brilliantly thought out. As you tag more areas, you'll draw the attention of local police, SWAT teams and ultimately Captain Oneshima, who will use deadly force to stop you if required. Some fun facts about Jet Set Radio. The game was released in the US as Jet Grind Radio due to various trademarks involving the term Jet Set. The game was developed by Sega Software R&D 6, who would be renamed as Smilebit in the time between the Japanese and Western release of the game. Sega Software R&D 6 consisted of Sega's merged internal CS1, CS2 and Sega PC teams. In 2001, Jet Set Radio was re-released in Japan on Dreamcast under the name Della Jet Set Radio bringing over the numerous changes made to the game for its western release, including gameplay tweaks and music from the North American release. Jet Set Radio's mixture of cutting-edge visual styles, incredible music and innovative gameplay make it one of the Dreamcast's most iconic releases, and seeing Shibuya Bus Terminal in all its cell shaded glory for the first time has been etched into my brain ever since. For me, if there's one game that epitomises the Dreamcast, it's Crazy Taxi. From the moment the attract mode kicks in, those blue blue Sega skies are blinding, as the game's four cabbies are shown ripping up various parts of the city, backed of course by the now legendary soundtrack including The Offspring and Bad Religion, which sadly I can't actually let you hear, because the video would get a copyright strike. The premise of Crazy Taxi is simple on paper but devilish in its execution. All four cabbies have their pros and cons, as you plot your path through the city, choosing passengers whose fare value depends on the colour of the dollar sign above their heads. The more you play the game, the more you learn your potential passengers traits and drop off locations, ultimately allowing you to plot and complete laps around the city to maximise your score. Starting off in the suburbs, you'll make your way to the big city via the freeway at the baseball stadium, and that's where the big money is made. But it's also where the game can throw you a curveball, as customers you thought you knew inexplicably change their destinations, forcing you to adapt and change tact. All the cabs have a set of special moves, including the crazy dash, limit cuts, crazy throughs, crazy drifts and crazy stops. Combine these moves while navigating traffic and dropping off passengers and your combos will rock it and so will your score. A tactic I use is to try and spot my next customer as I'm dropping off the current customer and crazy drift my cab into the drop off zone so that I'm facing the next customer and ready to go. When I first laid eyes on Crazy Taxi, the thing that struck me more than the visuals and the gameplay was just the sheer vibe of the game. It feels so in tune with the era it was released, with iconic brands like Pizza Hut, Fila, Levi and the now defunct Tower Records, combined with a soundtrack that has quite rightly gone on to be one of gaming's most recognisable and quote worthy. 
the look, the feel, the sights, the sounds and the gameplay of Crazy Taxi are almost a perfect near symbiotic recipe that is executed to perfection. Thanks to Crazy Taxi being powered by the Dreamcast based Naomi arcade board, the Dreamcast port was absolutely flawless and remains one of the best games on the system even today. In fact, the port is so accurate that the rare spots where the Naomi games suffer slowdown also appear in the Dreamcast version. Some may think that the brands and the music age this game somewhat, but for me that's what makes it so iconic. Crazy Taxi is like a gaming time capsule, preserving a snapshot of both gaming and society for future generations to enjoy, and every time I boot it up, I'm transported back to the year 2000, a truly iconic Dreamcast release. Res may have released long after the Dreamcast's official discontinuation, but it remains one of the most recognisable and unique titles on the system. Developed by United Game Artists, headed by none other than AM3's legendary Tetsuya Mizuguchi, who worked as producer on Res, United Game Artists also included several members of the disbanded Team Andromeda of Panzer Dragoon fame. United Game Artists would be assimilated into Sonic Team in 2003, after just three Dreamcast games, Space Channel 5 and its sequel, Space Channel 5 Part 2, completing the trio. The changes at Sega led to Mizuguchi-san leaving the company and forming his own studio, Q Entertainment, who would release Res HD on Xbox Live Arcade for the Xbox 360 in 2008. The best way to describe Res is Panzer Dragoon meets Space Harrier, which takes place inside a psychedelic wireframe world where defeated enemies release sounds akin to music notes which blend with the background beat. As you move through the stages, the music intensifies along with a number of enemies. The soundtrack itself is a mixture of electronic and industrial dance, and its soundtrack remains one of the most iconic in the Dreamcast library. Your score increases in line with how accurately you take out enemies to the beat of the music. Story-wise, the game takes place inside a supercomputer named the K-Project, which is controlled by an AI named Eden. After becoming overwhelmed with knowledge, a virus infects Eden, causing her to put the system into a violent shutdown. You take on the role of a protagonist AI named Swayzak, taking on Eden's defence systems in order to shut down the cause of the virus. Res was also ported to PlayStation 2 in 2002, and it is one of the most instantly recognisable games in the Dreamcast library due to its striking and unique visual style. This one impresses just as much today as it did in 2001.